Uh, this morning I'm going to talk to you a little bit about IP and wearable technology. Um, starting with this slide, a lovely picture of a 300-year-old uh, Chinese Qing Dynasty ring just to show technology, wearable technology is not, not new. It's been around for a long time. Unfortunately, this ring is not available to buy because it's, it's a little bit old. But let's just look a little bit more about what is wearable technology today because what we're really talking about has moved on a little bit in the last 300 years and as I'm sure you all know really we're talking about um, effectively computing technology or access to computing technology in something that you wear um, and normally the sorts of technologies we're looking at have some sort of um, portable data monitoring um, ability they can record things like uh, your activities, your steps, your sleep activity, um, body functions, heart rate, blood pressure, um, and provide often real-time feedback. Um, and they have normally some sort of communication functionality, which is um, important when we're coming to look at what sort of IP protection there might be for these devices. Amazon have gone a slightly different direction. They're just starting, they've just announced they're developing an Alexa enabled glass which will use bone conduction technology to allow you to give voice commands um, to your Alexa connected device um, and Google Glass themselves haven't given up they have a what they call an enterprise edition which they're now using in uh, industry um, to enable people in factories to work more effectively so the example uh, uh, that I've seen is the idea that you're putting together flat pack furniture but with the IKEA guide in your glasses on your head which uh, helps you work through step by step. That to me seems to take a lot of the fun out of putting together flat pack <laughs> furniture but um, I can see that it, it, it's apparently very good for productivity in industry. And then moving on to some perhaps less familiar um, wearable devices. Uh, Levi and uh, Google have just launched their commuter jacket which has um, a touchable uh, fabric so that you can uh, control your mobile device through your, through your clothing. Um, there are things like uh, wearable contact lenses that give you some of the functionality you get with, with wearable glasses, but uh, they're more subtle. Um, wearable tattoos um, and all sorts of different uh, interesting developments of wearable patches that again connect with mobile devices. So there's one uh, that will measure your UV uh, uh, how much UV your, your, your skin is uh, taking in and can give you some guidance on whether or not you need to wear sunscreen. Um, there are other patches that help tell you if your posture is bad and, and give you little electronic reminders that you need to sit up straighter. So um, um, <laughs> I'm watching the inf impact that's having in the room. <laughs> um, so there are, there are loads of different wearable texts out there. And before we start looking at the IP, um, I just want to have a little bit more of a look at what's going on in the market. Um, out of interest, uh, can I have a show of hands? How many people are wearing um, a wearable device today? Okay, so, so surprisingly, surprisingly few. Well, it, it, it looks like in the future that's set to change. Um, wearable devices are predicted to grow and grow as an industry over the next five years. Um, this is data taken from a forecast by the International Data Corporation, which they released in September this year. And what they've said is this year they anticipate there is going to be 121.7 million wearable devices shipped, which is a 16.6% increase on last year. And in the next five years, they expect that pace of growth to continue, um, with shipments reaching 229.5 million units by 2021. Um, and as you'll see, there's a trend that there are going to be more devices sold, also more smarter devices um, sold. Um, and something interesting going on with the price there, it looks like in the next few years, I guess, as, as the devices become um, smarter and, and have more technology included in them, it's expected that the price, the average selling price will go up. But then as that becomes more the norm, it will start to drop off again. So um, perhaps something similar to what we've seen in, in the mobile device market. And just to give you an idea about um, who, who some of the big players are and where they stand in the market, um, a separate report from Strategy Analytics has said that in Q2 2017, 
The world's largest device manufacturer was um, Xiaomi with 13.4% of the market, followed closely by Apple with 13% and Fitbit with 12.9%. So we're getting a, a mix of um, both uh, traditional sort of mobile phone device manufacturers and also the newer wearable um, fitness tracker uh, companies in the market. And then just to show what's happening by, happening by different uh, wearable product categories, um, the main categories at the moment are and, and will continue to be um, wristbands and, and wristwatches, which is you know, where we see most devices, but there's going to be an increasing growth in um, clothing and earwear in particular. Um, so things to look out for there. And then just to give you some examples of um, what, what some of the companies are doing, there have been a lot of acquisitions because there are lots of um, smaller companies uh, coming up with wearable technology who are being bought by bigger players who want to expand their offering or include new functionality into their more established products or just acquire um, technology and IP rights. Um, and in particular, the Microsoft acquisition was specifically an acquisition of, of IP. And the Jawbone acquisition of Body Media is widely reported to have been really all about the underlying patents. I think there are about 150 Body Media patents that Jawbone acquired there. So what does that mean for IP protection of wearables? Well, as I've said, growth in this sector is expected to continue. And what we're seeing with all of these different players and, and different technologies coming together is there's this kind of convergence of um, uh, lots of companies that have either been in, in related um, industries, in some cases in, in not so related industries, and also new players coming into the market. And they're all fighting for the same, the same customers. Um, so it means that there is some serious competition in this market, and that means getting your IP protection right is really important. Um, it's a good way of distinguishing your product with the right brand or, or unique and proprietary technology, um, protecting from other people from copying. It's a good way of in, ensuring that you get investment or collaboration um, with other companies because you can have something uh, valuable to offer them. Um, and it helps to protect your growth as a company. Um, but it's also really important because even if you don't get IP protection, other people will be. And there are um, plenty of companies out there who will be in this market, not just for their own products, but to license IP um, and get money that way, or potentially to, to have fights and, and try and drive companies out of the market through litigation if they won't license IP. So I'm going to focus, first of all, on um, patenting uh, wearable technology. Um, there are some challenges with, with getting patents. Patents are um, great protection if you've got good technology, because they give you a 20-year monopoly against someone else using your patented technology. But in this area, there are a couple of exclusions to patentability, which are potentially going to bite. Um, so where we're looking at... Um, wearable medical devices. Um, there are issues about exclusions for, uh, from patentability for methods of treatment um, and, and diagnostic. Um, and also where we're looking at a lot of the uh, unique uh, technology being in effectively software apps, there are exclusions from patentability for computer programs as such. Um, in both cases it's possible to to apply for patents in these areas, it's just a case of making sure that the patent's carefully drafted um, so that it works around the exclusions. And there may also be tactical questions about where you apply for your patents. So for example, when you look at the computer program exception, um, the European Patent Office tends to be more forgiving of patent applications in that area than, than the UK Patent Office. So strategically, it may be better to get a European patent that has application in the UK, at least from the perspective of, of getting a patent granted. Um, other issues uh, are because, as I've said, there are so many competitors in the market, um, there's competition with other people trying to develop some similar products and they may well get their patent applications in first. Um, there's also a real issue because a lot of this technology is being repurposed from other fields, a lot of the technology is already patented. 
Um, so when we're looking at communications technology, for example, um, the patents you know, go, go way back and, and it means that things that you're doing aren't, are unlikely to be new or if they are new, inventive in, in a lot of areas where we've already seen the same sort of functionality in mobile devices, for example. Um, another issue with, with getting um, patents is even if you get a patent through to grants, um, a lot of high-tech patents we, we've seen, particularly in the mobile uh, phone sector, um, tend not to stand up to challenge because they're often protecting incremental developments um, and don't show a big enough jump to meet the non-obviousness test that we need for patentability. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not worth getting uh, the patent application because uh, having, having granted patents or even patent applications can be very useful to show potential collaboration partners or potential acquirers that there's, there's value to your business, there's something unique and, and you've got some sort of protection. Um, and also if it comes to uh, licensing negotiations or litigation, it gives you something to potentially fight back with or um, give you know, some, some semblance of more value with. And another thing that we've really learned from the mobile patent wars is that actually you don't necessarily need to have good patents um, to make someone's life difficult. The fact that you've got a lot of bad patents if you're prepared to litigate on them and if you've got the money to litigate on them means that you can bog down other companies in years of litigation. Um, even if the end result doesn't look certain. And there are strategic ways that you can play the patent litigation system, which I'll touch on in a minute, which, which can help support that sort of litigation uh, tactic. Another potential issue with patents here is that actually where we're looking at wearable devices as a fashion item and, and fashions are changing, um, anything other than the sort of core technology is likely to be too quick moving for it to be worth waiting to get a patent because it can take sort of three, four or often many more years to get a patent to grant and you can't enforce your patent until it's granted. So it's, it just might not be the right um, protection in this field. So does that mean people aren't getting patents? Well, well no. What we've seen is that actually there are um, increasing numbers of patent filings in this field. Um, so this is one report showing the um, number of patents filings and, and the growth rate of patent filings at 40% um, between 2010 and 2015. And then just to show you who uh, owns the patents, again, this is a, a, a different um, report from Lex Innova um, showing what I think is quite interesting here is how many different um, players own patents that are relevant in this sector. So we've got sort of established technology companies um, and like Microsoft, chip manufacturers like Qualcomm and Intel, uh, the mobile manufacturers like Samsung, Sony, LG, Apple, Nokia. Um, but then we've also got the newer wearable companies, Jawbone and Fitbit are both up there. Um, some medical device companies like, for example, Med Medtronic. Um, so there's, there's a real mix of, of companies in this space. So as I said, the, the fact that lots of other players are in, in this area means that when you're looking at IP protection, you need to be looking at what other people are doing as well. Um, and as we've just seen, a number of these established players hold strong patent portfolios. So it means that for, certainly for new entrants into the industry, but, but any companies in the industry, they need to be preparing for what to do about licensing other people's patents and potentially fighting other people's patents. Um, and ways to, to be prepared for that. One is, as I said, to have your own portfolio of patent applications um, because it potentially gives you your own arsenal to, to negotiate with or fight back with. Um, and that can be through your own organic development or acquiring companies or being acquired as a company um, to consolidate patent offerings. Um, being prepared to take licenses of um, other people's patents. So when you're looking at business planning, you need to look at how much money you might have to put aside to take those licenses and to be able to operate in the field. Um, and potentially having a litigation strategy ready to challenge other people's patents, um, either defensively or potentially offensively um, as a way of, of challenging competitors. Um, 
And again, that, that, that means having some sort of fighting fund because patent litigation is often very expensive. Um, another important thing to note is that there are some areas of technology here, and particularly communications technologies, which are, are li you're likely to be using something that's standardized and that someone else has developed, because with most of these um, devices, you're not, you're not going to want to develop your own uh, new proprietary communications um, technology, because that will make your product um, have limited interactivity with anyone else's devices if you wanted to work with a mobile phone, for example. Um, and what standardized technologies often mean is that um, there's a benefit, which is that most standards bodies require people who, take, who own patents that are standardized, cover standardized technology, to um, offer licenses on fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms. So that's a situation where you should be able to get a license to the IP that you need. You're not necessarily facing um, having to find other technology. Um, but it does mean uh, that there are advantages for people holding those patents if they want to um, have fights with you because they think what you want to pay is not fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory. And there's a whole body of competition law about how the licensing negotiations should proceed and when you can and can't um, fight and potentially stop someone from using that technology. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few examples of uh, litigation in this area, just to say that companies are litigating. Um, there's, a, there's a reasonable amount of patent litigation out there. There's not lots and lots of patent litigation yet, but I expect the amount of litigation is likely to increase, um, given the increased competition in the market. So um, some examples here, Adidas and Under Armour, um, Adidas sued in February 2014, on 10 of its uh, patents relating to fitness tracking type um, technologies. Um, and that was quite interesting because it was settled with Under Armour taking a license. Um, we don't know how much that license was for, uh, and it may have been that actually the value in some way represented just an end to the litigation. But it suggests that Under Armour saw some value in, in that technology and licensing it. Um, Jawbone and Fitbit was something of an ep epic battle so this was started in May 2015 by Jawbone alleging uh, infringement in California, Delaware and the ITC in the US of various of its patents and, and many of them were the ones that it had acquired from Body Media. Um, and it also alleged that Fitbit had stolen its trade secrets. So apparently Fitbit, um, according to, to Jawbone, Fitbit had phoned up, up to 30% of um, Jawbone's employees uh, trying to poach them and trying to get information about the company and eventually it took five employees from Fitbit and Fitbit says those employees took confidential information and, and subsequently Fitbit's products started to use technology that previously um, they hadn't used that was the same sort of technology that Jawbone was using. Um, Fitbit countersued also alleging patent infringement and uh, both in, in the US district courts and in the ITC and subsequently, the ITC found uh, the patents that had been asserted by Jawbone, that had been acquired from Body Media, to be invalid. Um, and then, interestingly, at the end of last year, Fitbit withdrew its ITC complaint on the basis that it thought um, Jawbone was bankrupt or near enough bankrupt. Back in March this year, um, it looked like the dispute was still continuing, at least in relation to the trade secret allegations. And then we got to June and Jawbone went into liquidation. So uh, I don't think the litigation was the reason for that. There are all sorts of other issues about what was going on with Jawbone. But um, it, it may have been a contributing factor because it will, will have been very expensive for both sides to uh, fight those patents. And... Um, I've not read anything yet about what's happened to Jawbone's patent portfolio, but I suspect it will be um, sold off and, and probably fought over in, in the near future, if, not, if it's not been already. Um, and then the third case is um, Valencell against Apple and Fitbit. So these are actions that were started in January 2016, again in the US District Courts, alleging infringement of four heart rate sensing patents by Apple um, and by Fitbit. And again, interestingly, there was an allegation of um, uh, trade secret misappropriation by 
Apple. Um, so those cases are ongoing, um, but the Fitbit action is currently stayed in the US pending uh, the Patent Office doing an inter-parties review of some of the patents. Um, so so people, are, people are fighting, um, and that's something in the, in the sector I think that you know, companies need to be, be aware of. Um, I've put up here some examples of the types of um, patents that were in issue in these proceedings. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it for long because we're, I think we're going to run short on time, but um, they all seem to be kind of fitness tracking related and relatively sort of high level, widely uh, drafted patents. And, and that's interesting because it means the chance of them being infringed uh, is higher, but the chance of them being invalid is also higher. Um, and that's something that plays into uh, the strategy for non-practicing entities, which is something, again, we've seen uh, happen in the mobile phone sector, and it's something that I could see potentially becoming another battleground in the wearables sector. Um, because non-practicing entities just want to apply maximum pressure, get their money, get their settlement, um, and one of the ways that we've seen them do this is to take exactly the sorts of patents that we've seen here that have broad claims are probably infringed but may not be valid. And what they often do is they take them somewhere like Germany. Um, the German patent system is bifurcated, which means you look at infringement separately from looking at whether or not the patent is valid. And at the moment, infringement is much faster, which means um, you get sued for infringement in Germany, uh, there's a quick infringement trial. Unless there's a very strong invalidity case, the German courts won't usually stay. Um, so they'll give a judgment, finding infringement, and then they'll allow you an injunction. And if you pay security, they'll allow you to enforce that injunction. So that can be a very powerful tool for taking people um, off one of the largest markets in Europe. Um, so that's, that's something that I, I could see coming in this sector, which again, people need to be aware of. And there are various, various strategies for dealing with that, which um, I haven't got time to go through now, but you know, are things, it's something to be aware of. So quickly, um, I'm just going to move on to other types of IP protection. Um, this is an example of some wearable collaborations, and it, it's, there, are, there are many, many out there. It's just some examples. But what's quite interesting is most of these are partnerships between a technology company on the one hand and um, a big name brand on the other hand. And what that shows is that slightly differently to um, other tech sectors, because we're talking about things that you're wearing here, the brand matters and the design matters um, much more to the consumer. And um, just a few quotes here about the brand being important. Um, if you don't have a brand, it's hard to be legit in this space. Um, that was the CEO of, of Misfit, who incidentally made my very... Uh, flashy fitness tracker. Um, uh, we need brands to bring the product to market. We're expert when it comes to the tech, but we rely on brand partners. Um, that was the uh, fashion wearables business strategist at Intel. Um, and then a, a, similar, a similar quote from um, uh, Levi Strauss about the importance of going to someone who knows about design when you're looking at these sorts of products. Um, so... It's unsurprising, but I think there is a difference in the market here about how important branding is and getting the right brand and potentially getting the right collaboration partner if you're a technology company um, wanting to, to break into this area. Um, other types of IP to think about when you, you want to protect a wearable product. Um, so it's possible to get um, uh, utility models, which are um, shorter-term sort of uh, patents which are less strongly examined but uh, don't provide such a long period of protection. Um, they're normally between 6 or 15 years protection depending on what country you're looking on at but that's another potential way of protecting uh, technology but then if you're in discussions, licensing discussions or litigation against some of the big players in the industry we don't really see those sorts of IP being litigated because they tend not to be as strong. Um, uh, there are various different design rights protections available, um, both registered and unregistered um, in the UK and, and Europe that can protect um, the look and, and feel or ornamental design of your product. Um, some of them just uh, 
so unregistered design rights in the UK just come into being as soon as you design your product. Um, others like the registered community design you need to apply for, but they tend to last for longer. Um, copyright potentially can be relied on uh, in, to protect software in situations where you're looking at the pure code and you don't have uh, the technical effect that you need to patent um, some a software invention. Um, but again, it only protects against copying and potentially there are issues there improving that. Um, and, and trade secrets um, can protect confidential information. And we've already seen that uh, people are relying on those in, in court in this area. Um, and then finally, just to flag that unsurprisingly, there are a whole host of other legal issues in this area to consider, um, none of which I'm an expert on, but I've just put some of them up there. Um, the last one, the impact on professional sports is quite interesting. There are a few sports bodies now looking at um, what they should be doing in relation to wearable technology and whether or not um, it's acceptable for sportsmen to use that uh, to improve their uh, sporting performance. And um, a final example, uh, this is a headline uh, that I read that, that um, I'm not sure if it's a cautionary tale because I'm hoping that none of you would, uh, would want to, to, <laughs> to murder anybody anyway. Um, but this was quite an interesting case where um, uh, a man's wife died. Uh, he said, oh, she collapsed as soon as she got home and got out of the car. I tried to help her. I couldn't. And actually, her Fitbit data showed that she got home, walked around quite a lot and um, been moving for an hour and a half after her husband said she'd collapsed. So... Um, beware. Um, the, that, that's much more of a, of a data issue, but just beware. <laughs> anyway, um, that's the end of my talk. I suspect I've run over a little bit, so um, I suggest if you have any questions, unless there are any burning questions, I'm happy to take them in the coffee break, but I don't want to stand between you and coffee. Um, so thank you.